Welcome to a special edition of Conversations Across Time. What is at stake? Indeed, what is at stake for 2020? What is at stake for this election? What you are about to witness is uh, a, a show that will give you some of the sausage making of how we go about doing conversations across time. We have invited members of the ensemble cast and they are going to explain to you their characters, their motivation for how they portray their characters and have portrayed their characters on Conversations Across Time and how those characters would feel about what is currently going on. I don't need to tell you that this is the most transformational election that we will, that we have experienced thus far and possibly it can be likened only to uh, the point at which the union was torn in two. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce you to our, our, our first guest, and that is uh, Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman is, as I said, a member of the ensemble cast of Conversations Across Time. Please pay, pay attention. Please know that this is important information we want to share with you, and it is important that you share it with as many people as you know. Thank you. Mark? I portrayed uh, Ulysses S. Grant on a couple shows of uh, Conversations Across Time. And Grant's an interesting figure because as a general of the Army of the Potomac and later on a two-term president of the United States, he experienced many of the same issues and many of the same crises that are going on today. And I'm going to name, I'm going to explore four of those. One is voting by mail. Another one is an opening on the Supreme Court that had to be filled. A third is the rise of white supremacist terrorist groups. And the fourth is a disputed election of which we have potential. Let's talk about voting by mail first. I was commander of the Army of the Potomac, and the election of 1864 was uh, on the horizon between Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate, and uh, General McClellan, who was the Democratic candidate. And Lincoln was trailing, and uh, we decided that the Union soldiers should be able to, as was their right, to vote in the election of 1864. And the only way they could vote, since voting was done, was by mail. And the same issue was going on in 1864 that is relevant today. The opposition complained about voter fraud, that there would be too much voter fraud if there was voting by mail, and uh, that, that the, uh, the troops would be uh, coerced into voting for Lincoln, so on and so on. And we did have the election. The uh, Union troops voted by mail. Uh, some say that was one of the reasons Lincoln, who was the underdog, believe it or not, was able to win. And of course, that changed history. Uh, who knows what would happen if George McClellan had won. So we have that as a similarity. And um, uh, I can say for certainty, my soldiers were not intimidated to vote a certain way. And there was no very little, if any, voter fraud. So uh, Mr. Trump can go back to 1864 and look at that. The second thing that um, Grant will comment on, and it was very important, and it happened when he was the uh, general of the Army of the Potomac. And basically, that was there was a Supreme Court opening. Uh, Chief Justice Roger Tony had passed away in October before the election. And uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican president, and there was a Republican Senate, and Lincoln could have filled the post very easily. He decided not to. He decided to wait for the results of the election. And again, as I said before, Lincoln was trailing in the polls. That's a man of integrity. Contrast that with Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, and Donald J. Trump. The third thing, and this is very important, was the rise of white supremacy groups right after the Civil War. 
We have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. We have the rise, rise of the uh, white chameleons. We have the rise of the white brigade. And they were, per uh, the purpose of these groups primarily was to intimidate newly enfranchised black voters under the 15th Amendment. These people were engaged in burning down houses, intimidating black voters as much as they can because they knew that if the 15th Amendment was enforced, that the whole idea of white supremacy and the Southern way of life was going to change and then the South would become democratic and there would be equal representative for all people. So this was the way to suppress voting. And we have semblances of this now. Uh, President Trump uh, uh, threatens uh, or at least alludes to the fact that some of his white premises groups like the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys were go to the polls and intimidate voters. This is a playbook that I uh, uh, that, that Grant knew was wrong and was a violation of uh, the American Constitution. In fact, Grant was uh, in the forefront of passing the Enforcement Acts of uh, 1871 that uh, uh, it was uh, allow federal troops to go into the South, and the federal troops were able to um, uh, thwart some of the Klan's activities and uh, protect blacks voting under the 15th Amendment. The other thing, and this is very important, although it didn't happen yet, was the election of 1876. The country was divided like it is today. There was violence, there was rebellion against um, what was happening in terms of equality. Um, and <clears throat> the election was extremely close. In fact, it was the closest election in American history. Uh, there was disputed election between the electors in the states of Louisiana, Florida, uh, and Mississippi. And what happened was they didn't go to the court as Trump wants to do. They appointed a commission. The commission was supposed to be uh, from members of the House, Senate, and one Supreme Court justice who was supposed to be neutral. And uh, it was supposed to be uh, five Republicans, five Democrats, uh, and uh, one neutral member. And what happened basically was the commission ruled in favor of Ruther B. Hayes. But what the South threatened to do to, was to rebel against the uh, legitimate election. There were going to be riots, there was going to be violence, and a bargain, which was called the corrupt bargain, was reached between the Republican Party of Hayes and the Democratic Party of Samuel Tilden, that if they accepted the results of the election, which was 185 to 184 in the Electoral College at the time, that the Republicans in Congress and the Republican president would withdraw all the troops from the South and by doing so would end Reconstruction and would usher in, usher in the period of racial apartheid we call it Jim Crow uh, throughout history. And that is what happened. And Grant, who was really uh, a, an advocate of civil rights, who really believed in the 14th and 15th Amendment, was appalled. And um, he had served two terms. And at that time, uh, there were no limitations on presidential terms. And Grant basically uh, later on regretted not running for a third term because he believed that he was very popular. In fact, he was the youngest president at that time to ever be elected. He believed that uh, in retrospect, if he had been elected uh, for a third term, he might have been able to prevent the disputed election because he believed he would have won handily and reconstruction could have continued and we would have a different outcome in terms of racial uh, unrest and racial equality in this country. Grant is, um, and I, I studied the character uh, completely and in depth, Grant was uh, very, very, very strong on civil rights after he became president. Um, uh, later on, we're going to talk uh, to somebody to play Lyndon Johnson, but I would say 
that uh, Grant and Lyndon Johnson were the two strongest presidents on civil rights in uh, the history of this country for lots of reasons, not necessarily the best reasons, but the outcome was uh, what, what really counts. So basically, we have to look at four things. And it, the, the recurring theme through all of this is voter intimidation, voter suppression. They didn't want the union troops to vote. They had white uh, supremacist groups trying to intimidate through violence and terror black people from voting. They had uh, a Supreme Court nomination that Lincoln refused to, to and it's all going on today. And what we need to do is vote like our life depends on it because our life does depend on it. Now, what happened after that? Because it was so consequential. And I said that uh, that the election of 1877 ended Reconstruction and ended uh, the uh, rights of uh, black people to vote and to have equal protection under the law under the 14th Amendment and the right to suffrage, male suffrage under the 15th Amendment. So what happens after 1877 and what happens to the United States? And that is what is causing many of the problems, many of the conflicts, many of the uh, rebellions that are going on today. The fact is that the uh, era of Grant and the uh, election 1877 and the rise of white supremacist group was an attempt on the part of white Americans to maintain white power. And they were upset that they weren't going to maintain it. And that's what is going on today. And what happened in 1877, they won, and the United States and all people lost. And the uh, fact is, that's why this election is important. Because if we do not turn the page and we move in the same direction of the election 1877, we can have an outcome of another 100 years of racial strife and racial inequality. Now, that was Grant, and that was uh, what Grant believed and how Grant acted. And now I'm going to take a role of the historian of conversations across time and trace what happened in the United States as the historian from the aftermath of the, eight, the election of 1877 and what happened throughout the uh, 19th century to 20th century in terms of racial suppression and racial inequality. So now Reconstruction ended. Grant was retired. In fact, Grant became um, the eighth president of the National Rifle Association. So, you know, he had a wide range of uh, interest. And what happened in the South was the passage of Jim Crow laws. Once the Klan and the white Knights of the White Chameleon and the various other white supremacist groups were able to suppress the black votes and the uh, white supremacists gained control of the state uh, houses and the state legislatures, they passed a series of laws known as Jim Crow laws. And basically Jim Crow laws were separate but equal. They also passed a lot of laws that were in, in intended to uh, suppress black voting. In fact, they were passed to deny black voting. Poll taxes, for example, were passed in almost all the southern states where people had to pay to vote. Now, we have a, uh, an example of that in Florida where uh, the governor uh, said that black felons not black felons, but all felons, but uh, would have to pay all their fines or they couldn't vote. That's a, a form of a poll tax. And that's in, intended to suppress voting in uh, the state of Florida. They also had something called a literacy test. The literacy test was an attempt to make people take a oral test, knowledge of government. And since most people were 
not knowledgeable. And most people were illiterate. People were not passing, therefore they would lose the eligibility to vote. You might say, well, how does that discriminate against black people? That's how they got around the 14th Amendment. They said, no, everyone has to take it except if your father or your grandfather had voted before 1864 which meant that many white people could vote without taking the test since uh, most of the blacks were enslaved and were not allowed to vote. That was another method of voter discrimination. So this is what's going on in the South. And we had a system of apartheid, racial segregation, Jim Crow, and separate but equal. And it was, um, it was codified by laws throughout all the Southern states. And, uh, it was challenged in the Supreme Court in a case called Plessy versus Ferguson. And this ties in with how important the Supreme Court is. In that case, the Supreme Court ruled that it was legal to discriminate as long as they had what so-called equal facilities. So that was the doctrine of separate but equal, that it was okay to have separate water fountains. It was okay to have separate bathrooms. It was okay to have separate schools. It was okay to have separate lunch counters or if we refu even refuse service uh, to black people, that it was legal and the Supreme Court upheld it. And that's gonna last a long time and we're gonna have uh, Justice Marshall who fought against that and finally won uh, on later in another show. So basically this is what was going on and we had lynchings. We had burning down of uh, uh, affluent black areas in certain cities and certain communities. And things were pretty much the same until World War I, when uh, even though the army was segregated, blacks went over to Europe and fought in World War I for the United States. In fact, uh, John J. Persing, who was the commander of the United States troops was nicknamed Blackjack, not because he played Blackjack, because he originally was the commander of the segregated black troops. Anyway, when blacks returned home from the uh, World War I, a lot of them started to wonder what was going on in terms of uh, segregation since things were better in Europe in most of the countries they saw. And uh, even though uh, the civil rights groups like the NAACP and other groups rose before that, they became more powerful. And to counter that, there was a rebirth of the Klan. In the 1920s, and uh, there were large demonstrations, of the Klan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington in their robes, uh, protesting uh, any type of racial uh, equality. And... Um, Basically, they won again. And there was no racial justice and there was no, there was no way. There were all white juries in courts. People who committed uh, lynching were acquitted uh, all the time. And uh, people don't want to deal with that, but it was uh, as bad as South Africa was at its worst time. So we go through this period and of course the depression hurts everyone but the, the most impoverished in a depression are also the first hurt and the last to recover so that also impacted uh the racial division in this country and what really started to change was the activism of uh, black leaders uh and the entry of the united states in a world war two and uh, after the war, when the GIs came home and the contribution of the black troops, even though they were still segregated, uh, was known and they demanded equal rights, we had a lot more uh, protest and a lot more uh, uh, groups vying to get equal rights for everyone. And the uh, culmination is the start of what we would call the civil rights movement. And uh, one of the things that uh, happened, and uh, even though uh, you know there was still lots of racial injustice, but one of the things that occurred was the fact that uh, 
there were lots of lynchings. And when I say lynchings, lynching does not have to be someone being hung from a uh, tree, although that's a lynching. Lynching can be any type of murder that occurs without a fair trial, without somebody being trialed or for no reason. And the I call it the lynching of Emmett Till was one of the turning points in terms of uh, a move toward racial equality and the uh, the uh, brutal attack on uh, a young man, a young black man, shook this country. And since there was uh, better means of communication in uh, the 50s, and since there was uh, an attempt to, uh, uh, you know, improve things. So this is a turning point, and I really believe that uh, things started to get better, and we have to keep them moving in the right direction. And where we're at now is where the country was in 1864 to 1877. So I'm going to turn this back to Vivian, and uh, she's going to introduce another uh, character from the ensemble cast. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I'd like us to go now uh, to Mamie Till. And Mamie Till is portrayed by the actress Kimberly Gandy. She was portrayed on the show on Conversations Across Time. All of you fans know that. But let us hear from Mamie Till. Miss Mamie. My name is Kimberly Gandy, and I have played Mamie Till on um, several episodes of Conversations Across apologize for that. Um, there was a brief interruption. But as I continue, Mamie Till, um, after she allowed her child to be viewed um, in his casket to show the horrendous um, devastation that they had done to his body, uh, was a teaching moment. And from that teaching moment, Mamie Till went on to go to um, college at Chicago University, and she became a teacher. And in becoming a teacher, she created a group. Um, and this group was called the Emmett Till Players. And what they did was they learned and also performed famous speeches by civil rights leaders um, and coming back into why we need to vote. Uh, these speeches were done by civil rights leaders that were, I wanna say, fighting for the rights 
of minorities, fighting for the rights of underprivileged and underclass individuals. And when we when we think about you know the things that were done to my child, um, I did a tour uh, with the NAACP, or actually Mamie did a tour with the NAACP um, to give speeches so that the world would understand that what happened to her baby um, was something that needed to be shown. Um, and the gentleman, Roy Bryant, who was actually one of the murderers of her child, um, she listened to him do a conversation regarding her baby and how her child had destroyed his life. And his statement was, why can he just not die? You know, he's dead. And, and that was devastating, devastating to me. And then to find out, you know, years later that his wife, Carolyn Bryant, admitted that she lied. And Mamie Till's son lost his life over a lie. And those are things that we have to look at. And these are reasons why we have to vote because the administration right now is currently in, in, in disarray. And in order for us to speak as a unit, as one, we definitely have to speak by our vote. And I'm going to pass on to Ms. Vivian Crawford. So I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, I think that you, you've heard from the mother of, the actress that played the mother of Emmett Till, you've heard how significant that her decision was to have an open cas casket which showed how her son's body had been mutilated. Is that any different from what we're experiencing now? Is that any different from, uh, from, from, from what is going on now when we talk about Black Lives Matter, when we can see on open TV someone being killed by a police officer? Things are not any better and it is important that you vote. It's important that you participate. I'm going to ask that you uh, come back and join us for the second part, but please know, please vote. Vote as if your life depended on it because it does. It does. This, these are perilous times that we are living in. So uh, I, I, I ask you to stay tuned for part two of this very important discussion where we will be speaking with President Lyndon Johnson the actor that played President Lyndon Johnson and the actor that played Thurgood Marshall. Please come back.
Welcome to part two of our special election coverage, election 2020 coverage. Uh, I, for those of you that were here for the first part, you realize that everything is cyclical. We are dealing with things today that have happened in our country's past. Hopefully we can avert the, the terrible outcomes that happened in the past, but it is important that you, you vote and that you urge everyone that you know to vote. Your life depends on it. Your children's lives depend upon it. This is an important time. We are at a crossroads in the history of this country. I'm going to now uh, introduce you to uh, John Mason. And John Mason plays uh, Lyndon Johnson. He's a member of the ensemble cast, and he frequently plays Lyndon Johnson on our show. John. Hi, I'm John Mason, and I have played very many uh, important historical figures in American history, including the 36th President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. My fellow Americans, issues that I had hoped had been resolved during my administration have arisen. Racism has become utterly, totally blatant in our public discussions. Currently occupying the White House, the same White House that many, many great men have occupied, such as my mentor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, my predecessor, Lynn John Fitzgerald Kennedy. These men, imperfect though they were, made a commitment to raise up the quality of life of lower income and working people of all colors. And it was my purpose as president on utilizing what was called the Great Society to carry on the work of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. The New Deal was not a perfect system. There was much racial segregation in the New Deal programs, such as with Social Security. Many job classifications under under the new under in the were excluded from uh, from social security including such as domestic workers and agricultural workers by and large and almost entirely people of color and i have noticed that my in my position as senate majority leader happily working with the Eisenhower administration and Republic and even Republicans in the Senate that we were able to, from that position, I was, I saw the rise of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, a leading boycotts of certain facilities that committed racial segregation. Despite the promise of Plessy versus Ferguson, the reality was separate was not at all equal in facilities between white and those who are called colored. And, the, and I saw the dedication and commitment and bravery of those civil rights activists risking life and limb, literally, for the right to vote. Something so mon that we take for granted, some something that so many people fail to bother with. To vote for those persons who would affect uh, our livelihoods, our communities. And so many people refuse to 
Let's select that. Not understanding that they would be affected by those de decisions these office holders make. And I mean, see, even in my home state of Texas, when Dallas was a, just a seething cauldron of, of racist violence, the John Birch Society was very powerful there. And there were, there was even this poster of President Kennedy, like a wanted poster, calling him a traitor, worthy of death. And some fool, some maniac carried out that threat. And that is how I, I became president of the United States. I could not let Mr. Kennedy's death be in vain, nor also the deaths of the three civil rights workers, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, who were murdered in Mississippi. And I'm sorry to say, the entire white population of Mississippi was virtually complicit in, in the murder of these three brave young men. In 1964, we managed to have passed through the Congress the Civil Rights Act, which guarantees equality in all and the end of segregation in all facilities, education, public restrooms, housing, moving into neighborhoods, restaurants, what have you. But unfortunately, due the, to the um, political horse trading that I'm used to, the right to vote was not included. And, but in that year, I ran for president for my own term. And I ran against Barry Gold, Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona really a fine, honorable man. But he refused to listen to the, uh, the, cry, the call to end segregation and injustice on a most trivial and narrow constitutional excuse. I have no idea what really motivated him. But the Klansmen and the racists and the John Birchers, they flocked to his banner. He was, as you say, their guy. And that was the end of the Republic, beginning of the end of the Republican Party that I have been happy to work with. The so-called liberal and moderate elements were now on their way to decline. the people I was happy to work with and getting things done in, 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 the, in the Congress. And, and the next year, 1965, I saw the March on Selma where thousands of other brave and dedicated people, including the future Congressman John Lewis again, risk life and limb to, to, for the right to vote. And as we were approaching the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it seemed as if every law enforcement officer in the state attacked them with their batons and cracked, cracked the skull literally of Mr. Lewis. But fortunately he survived and served his, his his constituents honorably. That moved me. And from that struggle and sacrifice, I had the honor of signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And later on, 
I had the honor of appointing to the Supreme Court the first African-American man, Thurgood Marshall, who originally served in my administration as Solicitor General, and who served in the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. A man who also, even though utilizing the laws, risked his life. That's the pattern we have to face. Those who can't, the racists and segregationists of then and now, such as Mr. Trump, see that the laws aren't going to work their way. They're not going to be able to utilize the laws to repress and oppress and suppress civil rights activists of any stripe. So they're using brute force, either through police or so-called militiamen, glorified thugs, really. My friends, my fellow Americans, please do not let the sacrifice of these brave young men and women be in vain. Don't fall for the siren call of racial supremacy, so-called. Get out there and vote. Vote for your lives. Vote for your communities. Vote for the well-being of this country because those who use racism as a, as a propaganda tool, they don't care about you. They want you kept in ignorance and poverty for their benefit. Band together, people of all races, all genders, all classifications, please get out there and vote. And now I yield the floor to Ms. Vivian Crawford. Thank you. God bless America. Thank, thank you, John, and for your vivid interpretation of Lyndon Johnson. We have now our next guest is Warren Cooper, who portrays on the show a member, he's a member of the ensemble cast, as I told you, portrays Justice Thurgood Marshall. Welcome, Warren. Thank you, Vivian, and grace and peace to you all. My name is Warren Cooper, and it has been my honor on many occasions to uh, channel Justice Thurgood Marshall through Converse, this conversations across time wormhole uh, that uh, today gives me an interesting chance to share the stage, if you will, with uh, someone in my own timeline time zone. Great to see LBJ in the mix. And uh, it's a good thing also for me personally to kind of flow between uh, the lens of the voice that Thurgood Marshall might speak in, and uh, also the one of my uh, my own voice, which really is, uh, is, is moved to urgency about our need to engage. And uh, one of the uh, resonating things that I find with uh, being able to channel uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall uh, is the the ability to see what he's done in the context of uh, what he might say about today and looking forward, I believe what Justice Marshall would issue today is a, is a call to voice Thurgood Marshall, the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, the, the 32nd Solicitor General of the United States the judge of the United States Court of Appeals and Second Circuit. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and graduated from the Frederick Douglass Public High School. He went to my father's alma mater, Lincoln University, where he hung out with the likes of Cab Calloway and Langston Hughes, going on to graduate from the Howard University School of Law and as a lawyer in Baltimore, moved on to become the founder of the NAACP Legal 
defense and education fund and of course ascending to the supreme court it is uh, a figure that speaks from things that have happened things that he has done but I, I am moved by a number of things in how he came to be in those positions i will say editorially that the fact that justice marshall was succeeded by Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court inspires two passionate reactions from me. One is, I wish a thoroughgood would go back up into the Supreme Court, and I really do wish that a thoroughgood would go back into the Supreme Court. Of course, the theater that we are experiencing now is predictable and unfortunately very American. And editorially speaking, neither you nor I can vote on a Supreme Court justice, but there are lots of things that we can vote on. And we have called in this moment to, to exercise that possibility. So hopefully all in eye and earshot of, of this broadcast will, in fact, not only avail yourselves of that opportunity, but in, indeed apply yourselves to helping others to do that too, but I feel like I, I, I technically uh, digress. The second inspired, passionate reaction that I have to Clarence Thomas being the one to succeed Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court is not appropriate for this venue, so I'm not gonna share that. But what I am going to share is the deep resonance that I find with Justice Marshall. I am indeed refreshed with every opportunity to to channel his energy in, in in this space many are inspired and much has been made of the results connected to the supreme court justice used to be civil rights legal interim for the NAACP it is a celebration that is beyond appropriate and it's very important to remember all of the things that in fact he accomplished, particularly since so many of them are under active attack even as we speak. I am most impressed, however, and most informed by and most inspired by the process in which those achievements were realized, by what made it possible for Thurgood Marshall to be in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. His accomplishments and the fruit of result that has been born for civil rights and for human rights and for moral dignity, all of those things must be noted. And what seems most relevant to me about his story is the base of his conviction and the manner in which and the place from which he moved. There are some quotations from him that frame this specifically. He says, in recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. A another quote reads, to protest against injustice is the foundation of our American democracy. Another quote reads, reads you do what you think is right and you let the law catch up. And this quote, which speaks vividly to our present moment, he says, history teaches that grave threats to liberty often come in times of urgency when constitutional rights seem too extravagant to endure. I'm reminded of the 2001 Patriot Act, which in the wake of the fluffed fear of terrorism, which is not fluffed, I guess that's not fair, but it was the delivery mechanism for the relieving of our privacy even as we speak. COVID here in 2020 calls into question, among other things, the nature of our rights to or not to get the vaccine, whether we have the right to get tracked by our phones and have it kept track of everybody who we encounter. There's, of course, the threat to secured rights that are drifting into jeopardy, Roe v. Wade, Brown v. Board of Education, the Voting Rights Act, all of these things remain relevant. But what is most inspiring to me is that 
Thurgood Marshall's entire career was based on a goal-focused strategy offense. As much as he was a great lawyer, he was an equally talented strategist and general, authorizing and organizing a troop of justice in the war waged against uncivil rights, which would be for civil rights. He, and under the tutelage of his mentor, Charles Houston at the NAACP, they set two main targets in their sight from the very beginning. One was the separate but equal doctrine that saturated all laws that were in fact detrimental to uh, black lives as they did not matter. And also the issue of segregation in education. When Thurgood Marshall took over the NAACP special counsel in 1938, he traveled to dangerous areas in the South in order to investigate lynchings and the denial of voting rights, uh, jury service and fair trials to black colored African-American Negroes. All of these choices were strategic choices, moves that chiseled away in a chess game kind of way at the unjust structural impediments that were custom designed for black colored African-American Negro people. And in the presence of today's truths, it is in fact a one size fits all. The cases that they engaged were strategic. The Adams versus United States, uh, the, the focused on the military as a structure that needed to recognize the humanity of African American. Smith versus Albright concerned the right to vote in 1944. The University of Oklahoma, Sipquil versus the University of Oklahoma was a 1948 case where educational institutional discrimination was targeted specifically. Cooper versus Aaron, the backbone of the Little Rock Nine scenario as it unfolded so historically in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the Tinsley versus City of Richmond in 1961 that directly went after loitering laws as they were applied in a Jim Crow-esque era kind of way. The key elements of the playbook that they were using also for me bear noting because of the situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, a key play in the playbook is to use the system to improve the system with a human rights focused vision of what the system was intended to be. A second key play that occurs to me was present is choose your steps according to their orientation of the strategic goal. Every case that they took, every angle that they pursued in their arguments in that legal defense and education fund, all of those were set on the goals of taking power away from the separate but equal doctrine and the issues of segregation in education. And the third that seems most relevant for this moment is to be open and firm in your alliances. Justice Marshall's alliance with Justin Justice Brennan in the court was responsible for many human focused issues that have uh, unfolded. The aspect of uh, his connection with J. Edgar Hoover, well, that's another interesting uh, thing, but it matches the strategy that must be called for today. It seems that we are being called today into a focal, focused strategic perseverance in our effort to do what is right. In this moment, we have to know the play, it seems. And I would say, I wish a thorough good would go back into the Supreme Court, into the Board of Education, into the legislature, and into the bodega store, and into the ballot voting booth box. I wish a thorough good would, and I bet thorough good wishes a thorough good would too. I'm going to close with this quotation that's taken from uh, a 1976 celebration of the United States bicentennial. 
Justice Marshall says, this government they devised was defective from the start, requiring several amendments, a civil war and major social transformation to attain the system of constitutional government and its respect for the individual freedoms and human rights we hold so fundamental today. He goes on to say, the constitution as a living document included the Bill of Rights and other amendments protecting individual freedoms and human rights. And not a part of his quotation, but I imagine what he'd say today. It is this ever evolving America that we must defend. Cast your vote like it's your last vote because of me. Warren, I thank you. I thank you so much for that overview. And uh, at, at this point, I'd like, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. And uh, as, as we are wont to do, uh, if uh, we have a, a, a quote from Thomas Jefferson that is very appropriate for the dissertation that Warren just gave us in terms of talking about the Constitution and talking about the laws. And we ask you to pay attention to that. We ask you to, to vote as though your lives depended on it. And I'd, I'd like all of the panel members to come in, to come back in if you would. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank You're welcome. You, John. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, everybody. Get out of our place. Get out, Get out there and vote. You. Yes. Is there are any final words? Any final words that anyone yeah. wants to say? Vote. 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 And that that <laughs> concludes uh, that that concludes this episode. But you know our passion is to motivate you to vote because you know it's important. You understand that. And I don't want you to be dissuaded because, you know, they often say that folk don't come out to vote when it rains, whatever the weather is. I don't care if there's snow. Get out there and vote. You can vote early if you like. We, we did some shows on that. But we're asking you to make sure that you vote. And if we will end with the quote from, uh, from Thomas Jefferson and say, and bid you adieu. Thank you very much. This has been Vivian Crawford for Conversations Across Time. My guests have been Warren Cooper as Thurgood Marshall, John Mason as Lyndon Johnson, Kimberly Gandy as Mamie Till, Mark Hoffman as Ulysses Grant and Mark Hoffman, Conversations Across Time show historian. Thank you so much. And our heart beats in hopes that you will go out and you will vote. Please get everyone that you know to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you.